Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Muneeb. Um, I'm from India. And as I said, I'm currently in Northern India in Ladakh. Uh, I'm from a, clo a place close by uh, Kashmir. I generally have been working on mountain ungulates in the Himalayas. I recently did my PhD on mountain ungulates and disease ecology, but I'm generally very interested in mountain ungulate ecology, um, conservation in general, work a little bit with uh, their uh, predators, the snow leopard, of course, but I'm all about the mountain ungulate. So we'll, we'll delve into a bit more of that today. So with that, I'll start. Um, so just very quickly, the aim of today's session. Uh, so there's three broad aims uh, that I wanted to discuss today. Very briefly, we'll dive into the importance of studying mountain ungulates, uh, what they are, you know, why they're important to study. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about how to study them, because I feel like that's something that's discussed a lot, uh, but also not just how to study them. We'll also study, a little, uh, we'll also talk about uh, associated challenges uh, with studying them. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, we'll discuss some innovative ways to conserve mountain ungulates. So I think there's a lot of discussion that happens around uh, ways to conserve, you know, sort of snow leopards and other big predators. And I think that's important, but I think we haven't necessarily discussed um, a lot about conservation of mountain ungulates directly. Some, it's often that they get spoken about uh, as sort of an add-on uh, to their predators. But I think it's important to think about them in a more directed and a more central manner. So we'll discuss that a little bit uh, as well. But if along the way, you know, there's something else that you guys want to discuss or, you know, talk about, feel free to let me know. So with that, we'll jump right in um, with our very first activity. And I'd love for people to just type in their chat or feel free to unmute yourself and just tell me, you know, why do you think ungulates, particularly mountain ungulates, mountain ungulates are, as probably most of you know, these wild sheep and goat that live high up in the mountain. They're generally uh, from the family Caprine. And we're discussing mostly, uh, we're going to be mostly sort of centering this discussion on Asian mountain ungulates, but of course there's mountain ungulates across the world. So yeah, just, just feel free to share with me, uh, you know, why do you think ungulates are important? You can feel free to tell me in your context, you know, in your field style or study area. Yeah, why do you think they're important? in the most general sense. So yeah, anything in the chat? Or as I said, yeah, feel free to unmute and uh, tell me. So I think there's stuff in the chat. So there, yeah, Snow Leopard prey species, absolutely. What else? History? Ooh, not sure. Uh, Justin, do you want to say what you mean by that? Or just type? More. Well, they you find them in the rock carvings, right? Ah, the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they represent, you know, evolutionary history. Absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Wildlife. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Michaela says spreading plant seeds. That's very interesting. Generally, that's a that's an ecological function attributed mostly to birds. But yeah, you're absolutely spot on, uh, Michaela. I don't know. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Uh, maybe with an example or why, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess I don't have a specific example. I just know that, you know, living everyone, every kind of animal and plant has a tough time living at the top of the mountain. So any help that the plants get, you know, I know like the wind is a good pollinator and whatnot, but you know, the sheep and the mountain goats go to, certain like protected places that the wind might not get to as much and that might help the plants grow more and just like general ecological strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's absolutely wonderfully put. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I mean, quick anecdote on that. Uh, the, the species that you see in the picture uh, on my slide uh, is Asiatic Ibex and where I'm from, there's a saying, I mean, I don't know, uh, I'm sure there's, there must be something tested about it, but they say uh, there's a wild rose species. There's a few different species and subspecies. Uh, my vegetation taxonomy is not the best, but apparently the ibex uh, eat a lot of the wild uh, rosa and they are one of the primary uh, sort of, uh, what's the word, sort of distributors of the uh, rosa plant seed. And there's a strong correlation between ibex presence and uh, rosa presence in many valleys. And rosa is 
eaten by many different species, um, like different birds, even bears, for example. So yeah, that's a wonderful point. Uh, Wally says part of the food chain in general, absolutely critical. Uh, uh, Hakik says biotic requirements, important for snow leopard distribution, absolutely, uh, no doubt about that. Food for predators beyond the snow leopard as well, absolutely. Sustaining the ecosystem uh, makes uh, kind of sort of making sure the growth of vegetation is in check. Yeah, that's an interesting one, uh, Ismail. Actually, uh, you, uh, I don't know, do you want to share some thoughts on that? And then we can discuss that. Um, uh, well, it was just a thought because uh, typically mm -hmm. that's, that's what ungulates uh, have been keeping in check for millennia, if not decades, right? So I thought yeah. this also works in tandem with this. Absolutely. I think um, I'm a little less well-versed with it, but uh, there's a wonderful case study, I think, from the Yellowstone, uh, where they show, I think, when wolf numbers decreased, uh, elk numbers really went up, and that really drastically changed uh, the whole, you know, vegetation of the area because they were eating away, browsing away at large. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that was shaping... Uh, I was just going to say helping shape the landscape. Uh, so that's the next point in the chat. So absolutely correct. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's a wonderful set of points on the importance of ungulates. And yeah, just to say, these are just obviously not exhaustive, but just indicative. Uh, so clearly, you know, uh, ungulates, uh, particularly also mountain ungulates, are important in many, many forms. Uh, three, oops, I just... I just have three points that I think of, and as you guys pointed out, there's way more. Um, in terms of Asian mountain ungulates, particularly in the context of snow leopards, mountain ungulates are key determinants of snow leopard population. So what I mean by that is um, studies have shown that even though snow leopards might predate upon other uh, you know, uh, species such as marmots or, or even livestock per se, but wild ungulates are something that they absolutely need in, a, in order to sort of survive in what is called, quote unquote, healthy population. So, you know, it's almost, no, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's very, very hard for snow leopard populations to, to, to be present uh, unless, you know, good numbers of wild ungulates are there. So they're, they're absolutely critical. And this is very similar for other big cats and carnivores in general. But I think it's even more important for snow leopards because they live in these resource limited uh, systems. So clearly, Mountain ungulates are important. Uh, as we pointed out in the chat, mountain ungulates are also influencing vegetation structure and nutrient cycling. So it's super interesting um, and there's more literature on it. And again, I'm not the best person um, to sort of discuss this, but uh, there's a lot of interesting work to show that because of mountain ungulate grazing, the, there's a different sort of diversity of vegetation that occurs. There's more nutrient cycling through the sort of you know, the soil and vegetation layers. Uh, and if you remove them, suddenly, you know, your, uh, your land becomes less, uh, quote unquote, rich. Uh, so there's really interesting uh, work to show that. I mean, there's a lot of work to show uh, also that, you know, how there's carbon stocks in uh, rainforests that people talk about. But similarly, in these high altitude grasslands, because of livestock grazing, oh, sorry, because of uh, wild ungulate grazing, uh, you know, there is a positive uh, impact on carbon stocks of these landscapes as well. So there's very interesting new work being done there. And I think a couple of you alluded also to just the amazing cultural value uh, these ungulates have. For example, Justine spoke about the rock arts uh, and things um, that, you know, um, depict these wild ungulates. Again, where I work, uh, particularly the ibex and the blue sheep that you see in the photo here, they pop up in a lot of folklore in a lot of songs, in a lot of traditional ceremonies. So people have these very uh, sort of, you know, closely linked cultural bonds with these species. Um, and I like to call them the ecological fulcrum. So sort of this, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, kind of like a, like a balance. They, they're the sort of the middle point of uh, the ecosystem. And without them, you know, the balance of the ecosystem, quote unquote, sort of, you know, uh, is disrupted to a certain way. Uh, so yeah, I just think, uh, mountain ungulates are super important. Um, and yeah, these are just a few tidbits as to why. Just a bit of a graph, sorry, it's a lot going on in this graph. But to show you using empirical data, this is from India. Uh, we did a study across 10 sites in Himachal Pradesh. And what you see on the x-axis is prey density. 
per square kilometer. And what you see in the y-axis uh, up here uh, is snow leopard density. And as you can see, it's almost a, a linear relationship uh, as prey density increases, snow leopard density also increases, vice versa. I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of error, error around the estimate, but keeping away the noise, uh, this is just to show you uh, using empirical data that we do find these sort of you know, linear relationships between snow leopard densities and prey densities. This is from India. There's also evidence, I think, from Mongolia and some other places uh, as well. And this is a published study from 2021. So yeah, clearly prey is important, particularly for snow leopard densities. Um, let's move a little bit away from uh, their importance and think a little bit about challenges that might be associated uh, with studying ungulates, particularly mountain ungulates. Um, yeah, do you guys want to share your thoughts in the chat? What might be some challenges? Clearly, they're important to study. Clearly, they're important to conserve uh, because of all the different reasons that we spoke about. But then, yeah, what might be some challenges? Something in the chat, I think. Detection, yeah. Knowing actually that they're there and how many and where they are in the landscape might be, might be hard. Uh, the reach and the landmass that they cover absolutely smile. So they, yeah, they're just absolutely, um, you know, they're found in these massive areas. Uh, Hitendra says geographical challenges. Hitendra, do you want to elaborate what you mean by that? What I meant was the landscape that these ibex and these ungulates are found are really rugged. So the detection and study, it takes a lot of human resources to study them. So that, that yeah. was what I said. Absolutely. No, thanks. I absolutely agree. Uh, Michaela says very behavioral. Yeah, they can be very, very shy. Uh, they can be very cautious and not sort of yeah, allow you to come up close and, and see things and study them. So yeah, that links back to detection. Uh, yeah, anything else that people think might be challenges to studying ungulates in general? Great. Yeah. And if there's anything, oh yeah, Justine says movements. Yeah. They move from one place to the other. So we don't actually know where they might be. Bhuvan says camouflage. Yeah, absolutely. It's so hard. I mean, as you can see in this picture as well, I mean, here it's easier because the, the, the picture is much sort of, uh, you know, obvious where the ibex are, but their coloration, their behavior, mannerisms, you know, they camouflage so well with the environment that they're hard to see. Weather restraints, yeah, absolutely. You know, these mountain uh, systems are super erratic with their weather. Uh, so yeah, Justine says, we know very little about them. Yeah, just the baseline knowledge uh, of a species, lack of knowledge, exactly. Absolutely, no, thank you everyone for sharing those things. So there's plenty of challenges uh, to studying ungulates, uh, in general, particularly mountain ungulates. A few things uh, from my field site, uh, as some of you alluded to, Harsh weather. I mean, this is a photo from, I think, September. So it's not even, you know, peak winter. It's just about, I think this is October, not September. Uh, so it's like fall. And as you can see, you know, there's, lots, oh, there's more in the chat, I think. Lack of community involvement. Yes. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, why community involvement might be uh, important or, and why lack of it is a challenge? Um, hello? Yeah. Yeah. So in the, uh, I mean, uh, you know that uh, if you involve in, in studying uh, ungulates, if you involve the community, the local community who knows that area very well, it will be mm -hmm. very helpful. And also uh, the, thus you can uh, spread the knowledge among the community. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that. And I 100% agree. Most of the landscapes where at least I work, and I would say large parts of snow leopard range where ungulates are found, uh, there are multi-use landscapes where people live uh, either livestock with their livestock or agro-pastoralists in general. So yeah, local people's involvement uh, is absolutely crucial, and lack of it is definitely a challenge. So yeah, uh, coming back to uh, yeah some points from my field set, as I was saying, in northern India, harsh weather. Uh, we don't know when things might change, and that impacts a lot of different things, like detection um, being one of them. Uh, some of you alluded to the fact that there are large survey areas. So as you can see in this photo, uh, there's a colleague of mine, Tanzin, 
who was, I think, for Blue Sheep in this instance. But as you can see with all these rugged areas, and this, this is not even the most rugged area, it's more rolling than rugged, really. Uh, but just the vastness of the area can mean that you miss ungulates, you know, for example, if you're studying their population or just finding them to, let's say, answer ecological questions or conservation-related questions can be very, very hard. Uh, and one thing that I always put in, and my colleague would be not be happy to show uh, that I'm showing this picture, uh, is just the, the human cost of studying uh, these ungulates can be very, very high. And I think that's not spoken about a lot. Just, uh, you know, having to walk large distances or even travel large distances on uh, using vehicles such as cars or bikes or whatever it is. I think the human cost, just in terms of tiredness and the mental cost, sometimes is uh, not spoken about enough. And I think that uh, is definitely a case uh, that's there. These are just three of many, many points uh, that make studying mounted ungulates very, very challenging. But let's just take a step back for a second um, and really ask ourselves, uh, what is monitoring? Um, and I, the reason why I pose this question is because I feel one of the most important things to study about ungulates or any species in general is to understand their populations, where they're found, how many are there, you know, because I feel like that's really the baseline upon which we can build more information and eventually do more conservation uh, related work. So, you know, I think that's very important. And that really means we need to monitor their populations well. But to do that, we need to ask ourselves, you know, what exactly is uh, monitoring. And I've just picked up a couple of definitions from different uh, sort of sources. Just to sort of tell us, you know, remind ourselves what, what really this, this word is, although it seems very obvious. So monitoring, uh, oh, something in the chat. Uh, measuring progress, yeah. To see if everything goes well, to see what changes, absolutely. Yeah. Feel free to type in uh, what do you guys think, what monitoring is. Um, yeah, one of the definitions that I picked up was to observe and check the progress or quality of something over a period of time. So I think that's important. And keeping under systematic review. So what that basically means to me is that there needs to be repeated surveys or repeated something systematically repeated over time uh, for it to be monitoring keeping track, uh, as someone says in the chat, repeated measures, again, as someone says in the chat. Absolutely, these are all good facets of what monitoring is. Another definition that I found was to maintain regular surveillance uh, over time. Sorry, that's missing. Another uh, sort of definition was to watch, to keep track of, uh, or, to, or check for a specified purpose. Um, there's another... <clears throat> Uh, example in the chat that says changes from baseline absolutely another challenge is establishing a baseline absolutely Fabia I think that's so true because you know I think Justine or somebody in the chat previously said that you know we lack information so setting that baseline of information in and of itself is hard uh, so yeah thank you for sharing those uh, points so yeah there are all these very definitions of monitoring but I think we, what we agree is that there needs to be a sense of repeatedness, there needs to be a sense of observation, keeping track of something for a specified goal. I think that's important. Um, so yeah, I think what's key, as I highlight here in red below, is to, in terms of population monitoring, is to count individuals or species richness or diversity over time, particularly to detect change. I think that's important. I think one-time monitoring is also very useful, but if you're talking about term monitoring to look at change, I think that's 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 quite uh, useful as well. And as the last point says, it's a series of standardized surveys. So what that means basically is, let's say if you're doing them at the time period of a year, then there needs to be some standardization between years so things are comparable. In other words, if I do something one year and I do something completely different the next year, I think that's going to be, create a lot of issues. So there needs to be some sort of standardization uh, across whatever your time step uh, really is. Often with mountain ungulates, I think, at least in my field side, what I find hard to standardize is effort. One year, we might be able to do, let's say, two valleys. But then the second year, we might be able to do six valleys. And then the third year, because people are not available, we might be able to do three valleys again. 
So I think that change sometimes is very difficult to incorporate. So trying to standardize and saying, okay, maybe we won't do six valleys every year, but we'll do three because it's manageable. That's important. Uh, there's something in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Shezana says for baseline, multiple monitoring provides accuracy. Absolutely. Um, I think accuracy and precision are two things we'll discuss just very briefly soon. But I absolutely agree that if you do it multiple times, you'll be able to have a more accurate assessment of what your population might be. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing all these thoughts. So that's a bit about monitoring. Um, but why monitor? Like, what's important uh, about monitoring? I think you guys have already mentioned it. I think one of the ecological values of monitoring, particularly mountain ungulate populations, is to help understand what drives population change. So it's very clear that populations will change year to year, even if, you know, no, no population is completely static. It might be stable and there might not be overall changes, but there is always some change happening. So monitoring can help you answer what drives that change. There might be natural fluctuations, you know, in births and deaths. Uh, there might be some sort of persecution, maybe illegal killing or retaliatory killing for some reason. Uh, there might be habitat change that's happening, you know, loss of habitat. Lots of areas in my field site are undergoing loss of habitat, both sort of mining and hydroelectric power uh, related things. So there's lots of loss of habitat. There could be new diseases coming in. Like, for example, last year, I think, or I think it was a year before, uh, there was a huge wave of PPR and FMD. These are viruses that came into our field site and we lost quite a bit of livestock, but also wild ungulates. So that can change populations. And just climate change that's going on can impact populations in many different ways. So that's just a few tidbits as to why um, monitoring is important from an ecological perspective. But from a, a conservation perspective, monitoring is equally important uh, because as a lot of you sort of said, you know, they help you understand population baselines. It bas what that basically means is where is my population at, at a start point? Because once you establish that baseline robustly, you can see how things change over time and why. Um, and that's linked to population trends, as it says here. And then over time, uh, monitoring can help you identify conservation priorities, uh, you know, where certain things are more of a threat than others, so you can deal with them accordingly. So I think, yeah, there's lots of value uh, to monitoring both ecological and conservation related. But there's a lot of error that pops in uh, when we're monitoring ungulates. I mean, we'll talk about methods in a bit, uh, but just, you know, when you're monitoring something, you need to make sure, um, you know, you're monitoring it well. Uh, you need to make sure that you're, you get accurate data and precise data, but there's lots of sources of error. But let me, before I sort of go into that, let me ask uh, people, uh, what do people think about what, what, what is accuracy and precision? I mean, these are two things that pop up again and again when we talk about population size, you know, if populations are doing well or not well. So how do we know if something is accurate and precise? Can, can people share their thoughts on what those two terms might mean? Because I feel like both of them are then linked to sources of error, which we'll discuss in a second. Uh, but yeah, what's accurate data? What is precise data? And do we know if data is precise or do we know if data is accurate? Uh, yeah, any thoughts on that? Feel free to uh, unmute and tell me because I know it's hard to uh, type in the chat. So people say, based on chosen methodology, which can be double checked, absolutely. So if you're double checking something, you can see you know, how accurate or precise you are, uh, making sure that there are clear goals. Yeah, absolutely. Based experience, that's true as well. Other thoughts on what, what really is accuracy? Centralized database. Yamna, do you want to expand on that? What do you mean by that? Sir, where we have a um, database already developed where we can compare with maybe. So, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you have, let's say, a reference point, then you can see, you know, how 
um, close or far away your data might be from that. Absolutely. Depends on the surveyor. Okay. So yeah, I know these, are, uh, these two terms might be a bit confusing or, you know, they're a bit too obvious, but I think they're important to talk about. So to me, what accuracy really means is how close is your estimate of, let's say, a population, once you're monitoring it, to the real population. And that's very hard to know, uh, of course, because you never know the real population. So you want to make sure you use methods that are robust, so you get as accurate data to the real population as possible. Let me explain it in other words. For example, if you had a zoo, if you were working in a zoo, and you knew that you know there are, I don't know, 100 blue sheep living in an enclosure, and let's say you're using some method, uh, maybe camera trapping or some sort of field-based method um, to survey uh, those ungulates. And if you, if you use, let's say, three methods, method A, B, and C, and let's say if method A gives you a, a, an estimate of 50 individuals, method B gives you an estimate of 60 individuals, and method C gives you an estimate of 90 individuals, then you know that method C is the most accurate because you know the real uh, population. In reality, in uh, you know, in the wild, in our field sites, that's very hard to know because we never know the real sort of um, population. But yeah, just to get you start started to think about these terms, uh, that's what really accuracy is. And then precision is is sort of how confident are you uh, about uh, the estimate that you have? How precise? In other words, you know, if you have a range, uh, you know, generally it's hard to have an exact number of individuals. We generally say, you know, the, the estimate is 70 individuals, but the lower bound is maybe 60 and the upper bound is 80. So the tighter that estimate is, the more precise your data is. So what we really want is to reduce sources of error. And there are many sources which we'll discuss now because we're trying to go towards accuracy and precision. Uh, so I hope that's sort of uh, clear. Uh, and I'm sorry, I know there's a lot <clears throat> of definitions and sort of subtleties to that. Uh, there's something in the chat <clears throat> that says, choose the right time to study and equip surveyors with needed resources, training and equipment. Absolutely. Do you want to uh, expand on that a little bit? Uh, why it's important um, just to, uh, to choose the right time uh, to study and have good equipment? Uh, why might yeah. that? You know? yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, uh, like all this information should be, uh, I mean, described in the methodology, in the chosen methodology, but mm -hmm. you have to pay attention, like where you are based on the location, yeah, and then what time can be good, like to see the more uh, population of ungulates, yes, and you definitely know the location, and then based on that, you should choose the right time. And based on the maybe also weather or maybe the seasonal uh, some kind of uh, changes, yeah, you should uh, choose the right time. And then also uh, sometimes because of lack of uh, uh, surveyors, they may might include some volunteers, local volunteers. But mm -hmm. uh, you you will never know that what kind of knowledge do they have, despite uh, they have some diplomas in the certain area, yeah. Anyway, just to, in order to be sure, you have to uh, to explain the aim of the um, uh, study and what you are looking for. E everything should be uh, described and, uh, I mean, informed. And mm -hmm. after that, and if you give the all needed resources, they will never, I mean, it will be, the, there will be a possibility to have uh, more uh, accurate data because uh, if they don't have needed equipment, they might say like binoculars, let's say, yeah, they are not good enough, yeah. They mm -hmm. not see the good, uh, I mean, uh, well enough, and they might just give uh, approximate numbers, you know, they just to cover <laughs> the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. thanks. No, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I agree. Um, <clears throat> season is very important, and that's why choosing the right time and equipment, uh, because detection, uh, you know, distances are far and camouflage and all those things. So I think absolutely. Jalaluddin also says lack of coordination among relevant entities will affect the accuracy of data. Absolutely. I agree, uh, Jalaluddin, because if you generally we work in teams um, because landscapes are big and if there is not this coordination between these sub teams, uh, you know, we'll have data all over the place. So I think yeah, teamwork in general and coordination is absolutely important. So great, yeah, 
it's I guess it's what's clear from this discussion is it's important to reduce the source of error so we can have more accurate and and precise data. Um, and what I wanted to just uh, tell you guys, and maybe all, most of you know this already, but just to refresh your memory, if you if you do, there's a few different types of errors. So there is detection related errors. Um, and this is something to do with, uh, you know, what we just discussed, for example, if it's snowing a lot, you know, then you're not able to find animals. So that's a detection related error. Uh, you know, you might not have enough coordination between teams, as Jalaluddin said, that again, affects the detection of your species. And then that impacts accuracy and even precision to a certain point. I haven't put it there, but yeah. So it's important to think and ask yourself, okay, if I'm going out to survey, what are the things that are impacting detection and that might cause error? And the second thing, which I think most of us agree to, but sometimes we don't think about as much is sampling related error. So does somebody want to tell me what sampling related error might mean. I think we've discussed a lot about detection related error, uh, but what does sampling error mean? Maybe with an example, uh, yeah. Does anybody want to share what that might mean? How that might come across while we're surveying? So there's something in the chat. Choosing non-representative population samples. Okay, Altanai, do you wanna uh, expand what you mean by that? Oh, sure. For example, if it's a geographical survey and one of the methods could be, for example, to pick the distance between each village or something. And then mm -hmm. if it's, uh, like there should be some methodology to pick this distance between the villages. And if it's like too big, for example, it could lead that uh, some kind of data is omissed. And on the other side, if it's too small, then yeah, it could lead to just too high costs. Mm. of the survey so there should be some balance absolutely absolutely so and that i think uh, alludes to the point that we need to be very sure about what our sampling strategy really is so yeah i agree uh Hakeek, we should I... oh sorry yes, yes can I... yeah. uh, well it's uh, more like even in pakistan if i'm studying markor or hamalian markor in gb i must know which a sampling or where the most population occurs like it is also present in the pockets if i'm selecting a place where the sample size is small where it is present in the pockets it will definitely going to uh, affect my accuracy of data it may even change my baseline or even i know about the baseline of the area i can easily pinpoint the area where the maximum population occurs and i can study it and that sample size will be more accurate for my study rather than the mm -hmm. uh, species that are present in the pockets. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, the point I take away from what you just said is it's important to ensure we representatively sample areas rather than just choosing areas where we might know populations occur or, yep, you know, definitely. exactly, because that can bias our uh, results and hence impact accuracy. So what I, I think I'm trying to get to, and thank you so much guys for these points, because I think those are the most valuable points is, remember I said, we never really know the true reality of the population, right? But we're trying to get as accurate as possible. And by doing these things that we're just discussing, we're increasing the chances of our data being more accurate. So yeah, so, but yeah, just to uh, come back to the slide and say, think about errors that might impact detection and think about errors that are impacting sampling or rather how sampling is impacting those errors. Uh, so that's uh, there. And last but not the least, um, we need to really consider sample size, you know, how many surveys we're doing, how many observers are there, because the higher the sample size, and obviously that's generally a function of also resources, both money, time, people, you know, equipment, but if you have good sample size, uh, in order to detect changes in population over time, we're more likely to get more precise data as well. So I think that's important to think about. Uh, so yeah, these are just some tidbits about uh, error. Again, most of you already know this, but I think to speak about it explicitly sometimes means that we can deal with them better. So yeah, just detect, uh, thinking about detectability as well, because this, oh, there's something in the chat as well. Selection method is important as well, exactly which methods you use and how you use it. Um, 
and yeah, so error is important. Error is linked to detectability. Uh, detectability is basically what and what proportion of you know a total population you can actually see or detect. In other words, uh, again, a bit of text, so I apologize for that, but hopefully it's useful. Um, what is detectability? It is to com to compare population over space and time requires that you have a constant or a similar detection probability or for changes in detection probability to be corrected. In other words, let's say if you're doing surveys across years and if one year you're detecting almost everything that's out there, let's say because you know the weather is good, terrain is easy, all of that. But next year, because let's say the weather is bad, you know, you're not your sampling strategy wasn't the best because, you know, in year one, you went to six valleys and in year two, you only could do one valley. The amount you're detecting will be absolutely low compared to the first year. So if you don't account for that, then it's really uh, not right to compare population in year one to year two, because what's likely going to happen in year two, you're going to have a very low population, right? Because it's just because you're detecting less animals because of the way you serve it. But does that mean actually population is decreasing? Probably not. So that's why it's important to think about detectability, either to keep it constant or to account for it uh, in data. And we'll discuss a bit about that. And that really falls under the realm of analytics. But I think there's also a lot that can be done in sampling uh, and the way you sample as well. I think we discussed this already. There's lots of different factors that affect detectability of a species, especially in our landscapes, in the mountain landscapes. These include the terrain, rugged areas are generally harder to detect species, species biology. I know, for instance, when I'm studying Argali in uh, the sort of the Eastern area of, uh, of Ladakh, they're found in these rolling meadows uh, and they, they, they tend to run uh, away, you know, when they see people or when, they, or when they see danger, because that's generally the escape strategy of a sheep. So it's easier to spot them when they're running actually. But a lot of the capra species like Ibex or, or Markhor, they're known to go into these very, very rugged cliff areas. So they have like an escape terrain. And sometimes because of that by a species sort of, you know, natural history, they're even harder to see. So I think that impacts, we've talked about climate, time of survey, and just observer efficiency, you know, how good or tired or not so good an observer may be. And not correcting for detectability will result in a bias density estimator. Uh, I think we've, we've, we all agree with that. And we've discussed that a little bit. Um, a bit of uh, sort of a math here. I mean, it might look complicated, but I think we'll all agree. Basically, just uh, to before I put the equation up, uh, there's a few factors in the equation. N would be if let's say you have an abundance that you find of a species, you know, because you're monitoring that species. Small p is the detection probability. How much of that population you're detecting? And if C is your count statistic, like what you're actually looking for, I, the, the equation that we basically have is the count statistic that you are collecting is actually a function of P times N. What that basically means is that there is a detection factor. If, for instance, your detection probability is one, or in other words, you're detecting everything out there and you're sure about that, right? In other words, let's say if you have a small cage and you have 10 uh, individuals in that and you're sure you're counting all 10 because you know there's 10 in there, then P is one. But otherwise you have to estimate P. And then your count statistic is going to be... I think I froze for a second. So, yeah, before we go more, uh, I wanted to then discuss a few ways to study mountain ungulates, a few different methods. So we've talked about why monitoring is important. We've talked about, uh, you know, uh, error and whatnot. So what are the different methods? Because these methods really are our tools to study these mountain ungulates. To, to start off, um, you know, there's something called the total count, uh, which I think most of you might know. What total count basically means is you're going out and in a given area, you're counting all the animals. What you're assuming is that your detection probability is one, or in other words, the area that you're going out to count, you're seeing all the animals that are out there. So essentially what the total count does uh, is if you want a density, you know, you have a count, let's say in this picture, these are uh, lesser kudu, I think from somewhere in Africa, 
So let's say if your area is this line that I outlined here, and you might have an area of let's say 100 square kilometers, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six kudu in there. So essentially your density is gonna be six over 100 um, kudu per square kilometer, right? Because you're detecting all, or you're assuming that you're detecting all individuals. Generally, that's hard to achieve in our landscapes, but it's not impossible depending on where you are. And it's generally applicable for small areas. So that's total count. Then there's something called a block count that also happens. Um, and in a, I'll just put it up. Basically, in the block count, what we do is you have an area of interest, which is, again, this line that I have here. Within that, you randomly place these blocks, survey blocks, that you see here in uh, as a square. Um, and you count animals within that block. And basically, your abundance uh, there is C divided by A, which is C is the total animals counted uh, across blocks. And A is the proportion of area sampled. What I mean by that is, so in this case, we have these four blocks that we sampled. So whatever the area of that is in comparison to the total area, that's the proportion area sampled. Uh, so that will give you a sense of uh, abundance and density from uh, block counts. Similar to um, total counts, we're detecting, we're saying that the detection probability in these blocks is one. So we're counting everything in the blocks. But what's very important, and this goes back to sampling and sampling error, uh, is to uh, make sure that these blocks, or sometimes there are strips, you know, lines, are, are placed randomly across this landscape. And that's because if you don't put it randomly, I think as uh, Shazana said, and a few others also said before, you know, that would mean it, you could bias your results. Let's say if all these blocks are placed here, for example, right? All four are placed here. And for whatever reason, this is a very bad area for, in this case, let's say Markhor, then you're going to get almost no Markhor sightings at all. If all these four blocks are placed here, and maybe that's the best Markhor area, then you're going to get a very high density. And if you extrapolate it to, to all this area, you might think there's a lot more Markhor than you know, uh, there, are, there are out there. Uh, Hakik says something in the chat, similar to putting camera traps where detectability is high. Absolutely. Do you want to expand on that, Hakik? What do you mean by that? Uh, yeah. So, so biasing uh, your results and sort of like putting uh, cameras where you have, um, we have a lot of like abundance, but not mm -hmm. monitoring places where there could be uh, lower population. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're hitting the nail on the head for sampling related error, right? So we have to make sure we place them either as randomly as possible, or uh, if you know areas of low and high occurrences, then to make sure your blocks are placed across those areas. So yeah, thanks for that, Aki. So yeah, then we have, as I said, yeah, total count, block count. So these are just a few methods, right? I'm not explaining all the methods and we're going very fast but just to give you a sense. Uh, and maybe you, some of you are already doing some of this. Then the third method that is commonly used uh, in for ungulates in general, but also nowadays for mounted ungulates is distance sampling. Basically what happens there is you have again an area of interest, which is this green polygon. Generally you have, let's say if you have a human being uh, being the detector, he or she or they are walking a transect, right? In this case, it's this dotted line. And from that transit, they're looking, you know, on either side uh, and they're detecting individuals of, let's say, in this case, Argali. And what they're doing is they're not only, uh, you know, detecting individuals and counting their group sizes and whatnot, but they're also counting uh, their distance from the transit. Uh, and that's important. Oh, Shazana says something. Total count can also lead to errors as it can lead to multiple counting of single individuals if they're not marked or marking are not Absolutely, Shazana. I think, uh, do, you, do you want to share something more about that? I don't know if, if you have experience with total counts or why do you think this might be an issue? Well, we did went for a snow pit count in uh, Kunjurab National Park. The problem was mm -hmm. that uh, if I don't know the pattern on one species, then I can even simply we did put the camera traps there. Yeah. And... Uh, Pinpointing the pattern on one snow leopard and then differentiating it from the other, it is a tricky job. Yeah. 
Yeah. And even I am just sighting it through the binoculars or using some kind of that uh, equipment, it can also lead to multiple counts if I'm not very vigilant or mm -hmm. if I'm tired. So that uh, the total count gain, I think it is more prone to error of detectability than the other one. Sure, sure. I absolutely agree. And I think that's why um, total counts generally seem to work in very small areas where you do surveys very fast. Otherwise, my uh, I always have a bit of reservation against total counts, especially in our landscapes, because yeah, there are issues around double counting and yeah, ma mainly around double counting, especially uh, you know when uh, we're doing it with visual observers, especially for unmarked animals. As you said, for snow leopards, at least they have you know, body patterns with ungulates, that's not even there. So yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, just back to distance sampling. So yeah, as I was saying, we also take distancing into account. And the reason why we do that is to estimate uh, detection probability with as a function of distance. Like as you can see from this graph, this is just some dummy data. What basically distance sampling is telling you is at what distance from the observer, which is this line, is detection really going to zero, right? Because then you can start to guess how many animals you might miss, right? So today I'm not gonna go a lot into the analytics of things, uh, but we can discuss that uh, you know, in the at the end of our uh, session. But this is to just show you that unlike total counts and block counts, uh, detection um, probability where detection probability is one, in detect, uh, distance sampling, we're trying to estimate you know, this sort of varying detection probability with distance and then estimating how many ungulates we might have missed depending on, you know, what the distance from the transect really is. Uh, so yeah, just to give you a sense of the theory around it, even though uh, there's a lot to uh, discuss uh, about it. So just in terms of uh, the equations, you know, in this case, abundance is basically the count statistic divided by alpha P, where P is the probability of detection in this case. Uh, um, and A is the proportion of, you know, area surveyed. So there is this element of detection probability that scales your abundance. Um, there's a few key assumptions to think about. And again, as I said, this is not a um, session where I want to dwell deep into each uh, uh, method. So I apologize for skimming through very fast. Um, but yeah, there are a few key assumptions, you know, that these transects, or sometimes you even have points, people even do detection, uh, sorry, distinct sampling using camera traps for ungulates, that these are randomly placed in the area of interest. So again, you know, systematic sampling, random sampling is important. Um, P, which is the detection probability, is actually one on the line. So in other words, if there was an animal on this transect, you would actually be able to see that animal. It would not, this would not hold, let's say, if you know, you have a lot of fog, which could mean that you might have an animal on the transect in front of you and you still don't see it. So, you know, those things then affect, um, errors, right? But that is a detection related error then, not a sampling related error necessarily. So just to think about that. Um, and yeah, and objects are detected at their initial location. So they're not moving uh, while you're detecting them. So distance sampling is just another framework. Um, and lastly, uh, just to give you a flavor for the fourth one, which some of you might know already, uh, is something called the double observer surveys. Uh, these are something that we do um, predominantly here in India, across the Western Himalayas. Basically there, uh, I just get uh, the, all three things on the, um, uh, on the slide. Basically what happens is you have two teams and they're searching for and counting animals simultaneously. So as you can see in this schematic, you have observer one in the front and then observer two, they're generally divided by some uh, time. In this case, we generally say 30, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and they do the same transect. In this case, you know, observer one will go up here, then down, then observer two will come up same and down, but maybe 15 or 30 minutes uh, later. And the key assumption of this method is that groups of ungulates can be individually identified because essentially what you want is observer one to see, let's say group one, which has five males. And then observer two, 15 minutes later, uh, he, she, or they will see that same group. And if they know uh, it's also five males, Later, they will come and talk to each other and say, be like, okay, how many did you see today? Oh, I saw only one group. It had five males. What did you see today? Observer two will say, oh, I saw one group. It had five males. Then it's likely the same group. So this method is based on capture, recapture, very similar to uh, what we do for snow leopards and um, 
camera traps. Um, the other assumption here is that each survey unit uh, has entire visual coverage. So you have, let's say, a large area which is subdivided into survey areas. But those sub areas, both observers have good visual coverage. Uh, and last but not the least, observer one and observer two uh, survey areas independently. Uh, and what I mean by that is they don't talk to each other because then, you know, both their surveys will not be independent. Before I go on to the next slide, I don't know, uh, would people like to share um, their thoughts and maybe their experiences on studying ungulates? Have you guys used some of these methods? Have you used some other methods? Uh, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. These are just four of many, many methods. And subsequently, I'll show you a key that I've been working on with uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, to help people choose what methods to use uh, that are both robust in the field and analytically. But before I do that, uh, yeah, any thoughts like Shezana shared about total counts? Um, any thoughts that people have? Yeah, I'd love to know. Please feel free to unmute yourself or even type in the chat. Um, thoughts, experiences, ideas. Hi. Yes. Uh, can I ask for this double observer survey? Let's mm -hmm. say if the first observer accidentally like distracts the group and then the group runs away and the second mm -hmm. observer won't find the unglit population because they're away, right? How yeah. would that uh, like take into account or? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so two things. I mean, if that happens, uh, what is likely going to happen is observer two will not be able to detect group one because observer one has flushed them away, let's say. And what that happens is that impacts detection probability of observer two. Now there's two ways to account. Well, there's several ways, but two ways that I think of uh, that can be accounted for is we, we try to estimate the detection probability individually for observer one and observer two. Uh, I won't go into the details today, but um, we did a module on uh, ungulates, I think a couple of years ago. And I think it's up on uh, Sol Leopard Network's website where I discuss exactly how we do that uh, analytically both and, and in the field. But if we estimate detection probability for both, in this case, what will likely happen is observer one will have a higher detection probability because they're observing, let's say, more ungulates, whereas observer two will have a lower detection probability. So then we get a sense of how much uh, the observer two is missing. Uh, but that's more of an analytical sort of, uh, you know, sort of fix. The other thing to do is to ensure you train your observers really well. Uh, so they're, you know, not flushing animals uh, at all. But sometimes it's harder, easier said than done. You know, it's very hard in the field. So what we do is, um, if possible, rather than having, let's say, you know, if you have a valley going north to south, for example. So rather than having observer one in the front and then observer two behind that observer, if possible, we have them access from both sides. So even if animals are being flushed, then they're likely flushed in one direction of the observer uh, or, or one of the observers. So yeah, just to say that um, you can either deal with it analytically or in the field, but yeah, that's a problem uh, of this method in general. And last but not the least, um, in the analytics as well, there are different models that you can use. Uh, there's a behavioral model that says, okay, there is a behavioral impact of observer one on observer two's observations, similar to how uh, in capture recapture surveys, there is uh, impact of potentially the camera itself, or let's say the cap flash of the camera on the recapture of snow leopards. So yeah, just a couple of thoughts uh, on that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that was useful, but yeah, do, does anybody else want to jump in yes. with thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Ilbir's foundation has used the double observer survey last year, but I wasn't part of it. But as I understood, understood there were some challenges and they were discussing it also with the team and also with Justin as well, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm not sure what about that. But uh, I wanted to clarify that when you said observer one and observer two, are there uh, like single observer or there might be a group of people? Observer one will be five yeah. or four people, something like that. Yeah. And also, no, as I understood that double observer survey is the latest version of, is it, is it being tested 
uh, or only in our areas it is new. Uh, mm -hmm. Since it is new and there were some discussions and there were challenges as well. Sure, sure. So just to quickly answer the first question, um, observer one and observer two can be single observers, there can be multiple observers as well, two, three, four people. What's important is to keep that standard across surveys. So what I mean by that is um, generally in a landscape, um, you know, I to give you an example, we survey about 500 square kilometers roughly of mountain ungulate landscapes. And that takes us about eight to, well, six to eight days, depending on where we are in Northern India. And uh, even with a team of, let's say six to eight people, uh, per day, we can only do about three to four blocks because let's say if we are dividing that 500 square kilometer into survey blocks, right? Because each block, you need to make sure you have visual coverage. So as long as across those days and across blocks and across surveys, the number of observers are the same, you can have multiple observers you know, in a team. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, we've done up to four, not four, up to three observers in a team, um, both as observer one or observer team one and observer team two. So just to, and the reason why it's important to standardize that number across surveys is again, you know, it can impact your detection. If one day you have only one observer and then the other day you have four observers, then it's likely that the four observers on the second day will find more, uh, right? Usually. Uh, so if possible, that's there. Uh, and then the second uh, answer for you, um, double observer has definitely been tested. It's been tested a lot more in India. Definitely, we've used it for many years um, and it works fairly well here. We've also done it uh, and we've, there's a paper published from, from Kyrgyzstan. In fact, uh, Eastern Kyrgyzstan in Sarichat and Koilu, uh, an existent hunting reserve. So there it worked uh, uh, well, but there's also been lots of challenges. We tried to do it in Tajikistan for Markhor, and there we ran into a lot of challenges around, you know, flushing off individuals and whatnot. So yes, it's been tested. I can share some papers and resources with everyone, okay. but there are some local challenges as well. Yeah, and just to add, I think Tenje mm -hmm. was um, talking about the challenge of um, detection because uh, in some of these areas, for example, there's trophy hunting or there's yeah. So the the populations are very frightened. Um, so as you yeah. say, they, they move before observer two sees them. So that there is no recaptures or very, very few recaptures, right? Yeah. That becomes a problem. But like you said, there may be ways to address that and like shorter distances between observers and, and exactly. so on. But, but yeah, I think uh, Kenji, it always varies with every location, right? Um, with these kind of issues uh, and it depends on the species yeah. and how frightened they are. What I could recommend is, I mean, again, this is a, a toss up between time and resources. It would be interesting in those areas where you're finding challenges with double observer, maybe try to do a couple of other methods and see how estimates might vary with methods. And I think that might be interesting. Um, and this is why I wanted this session to be a littering of different methods rather than, you know, focusing on one method. So, yeah. And I think this is, there's something in the chat. Shazana said, even in Pakistan, it's considered robust. Yes, there's a few papers using double observer from Pakistan as well. well so even, can I add one more thing? Yeah, yeah, please. Well, even in the community game reserves and in, even in the game reserves here, we do go for population estimates before we start the trophy hunting mm -hmm. uh, for Marco especially. And if the estimates are good, we go for it or we just delay it for the next season. Absolutely, yeah. And that I think is good because that's evidence-based decision-making, right? Uh, so absolutely wonderful. Cool. So thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts um, and yeah, uh, experiences. Um, very quickly, sorry for this random arrow here. So this is a key and I think this I think is something uh, that's a bit of a work in progress. So don't take it for what it is right now, but just to show you uh, what I've been working on uh, with people like Justine, um, another colleague, Arash, uh, who's based in Berlin, uh, Ranjini, who's also in Berlin now, and Kostum, um, who many of you probably know. So basically, what we want to do is try to build a key uh, where uh, researchers, uh, you know, our different stakeholders can sort of use this key to say, okay, what method can I use in my landscape? As we said clearly, no method is the singular best method. 
right? There's many methods and depending on the context, different methods can be used. So just to give you a flavor uh, and, you know, expect this to change with time. Uh, but what we've done is we've said, okay, if we want abundances and densities, there are sort of two major sort of folks that we need to think about. Are we doing a census or an estimation? Because if you're doing a census, which basically means we're counting everything, then it's simple. You know, we don't need to worry about detection. We don't need to worry about anything. We just go out and count. Uh, we can do a total count, for instance, and we should be fine. Um, but if you're doing estimation, then we need to think about detection, as we said. And then we need to ask ourselves, who is detecting the species? Is it a human detecting the species or is it a non-human, like a camera trap or a drone, for instance? Within the human, you can have direct detections, right? Like you can have literally people go out with a binocular or spotting scope to detect the species. Or you can have indirect detections using signs or mostly using signs, I guess. So then to think about detection. After that, it becomes a bit complicated. <clears throat> and this is to just show you the wealth of things out there. Once we say, we know how we're detecting things, what analytical framework are we using? And I think this is very important. No method is independent of its analytical framework, especially when we're estimating things. So ask yourself, what is the analysis framework that we're using? We spoke a little bit about distance sampling, right? Like the fact that with distance, detection goes down. So is that the analytical framework? We talked about mark recapture. In Double Observer, you know, the things that we're marking and then recapturing are these ungulate groups that are not changing. So are we using that? Or are we using the gas model uh, analytical framework, which we haven't spoken about, but is being used? Um, and following the analytical framework, uh, what is the data collection method um, that, that we're using? So let me give you an example of how this key might be used. Uh, let's say if you're doing double observer surveys, uh, you know, we know we want abundance. We know it's not a census, so it's an estimation. Uh, in my field site, we use human detectors that go out and directly look at animals, right? Uh, using spotting scopes and, um, uh, and uh, binoculars. And we are using a mark recapture framework and we're doing double observer field surveys. So that's, uh, you know, how one can uh, use that. And one can do it the other way around by saying, okay, I want to do double observer surveys. So what analytical framework do I need? What detection ways do I need? And is it estimation or method um, census uh, and, and that. But because we've spoken a lot about human detectors, let me give you an example of a non-human detector uh, all the way at the bottom. So if we, again, want to do abundance estimation and we have a non-human sensor, let's say a camera trap, um, and that's, that's, that's here, there's this gas model analytical framework. It's called REM, the random encounter model, which talks about you know, how a gas moves in space and what's the probability two gas particles will collide. So using that sort of analytical frame and using some information on species movements and whatnot, you can guess, um, you know, what's the likelihood of a species getting captured in a camera and then using that, getting a sense of uh, populations. I've talked a little bit about that again in the SLN ungulate module uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, so you can check that, but I'm happy to share resources. But then again, yeah, you know, if a stakeholder wants to use camera trap, he or she can see, okay, what are the different camera trap things that I can do. So here you can see camera trap pops up three, four times, right? So do I want to do camera trap gas model? Do I have the analytical capability to do that? If not, can I do camera traps using spatial capture, recapture? Can I do camera trap related density sampling? Can I do camera trap related spatial counts? There's a whole wealth of uh, work out there. And in the eventual key, we'll have key references against these. So, you know, people can go and read that. But just to give you a flavor of different things that are out there. Uh, one more slide of me blabbing away and then we'll do an activity. Uh, oh yeah, Justine has put in the ungulate module. Thanks Justine for that. And I'm happy to discuss these, uh, you know, um, this key or uh, these methods in detail with everyone. Uh, I mean, I don't know all of them, but we can learn together about them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to also speak a little bit uh, before we sort of do more fun stuff. <laughs> about uh, studying ungulates along with their predators. See, I think we can't shy away from the fact that when it comes to uh, snow leopards and uh, their mountain ungulate prey, often people study ungulates like blue sheep, markhor, ibex, argali, because they're studying snow leopards. 
I mean, not all, but a lot of times. But I think there are some potential issues with that. So it's important to really think about study design. And I think a very good example uh, is the pause uh, sort of study design. That's the population assessment of the world's snow leopards, um, which is for snow leopards, but it gives you an indication of how to study these ungulates along with their predators. And I'll just pop up the schematic in front of you. Sorry, it's a bit of a sort of a uh, sort of lot of things going on, but let me walk you through it. Uh, and I want to make one key point with that. So what pause says, this is for snow leopards, but it's equally applicable for ungulates. You have, you do different surveys, you know, like you do interview surveys or primary surveys in the mountains, like science surveys or literature surveys to understand snow leopard occupancy. In other words, where are snow leopards found? You could do the same for ungulates, right? Based on that, you do a stratification. I think this is very important. What that means is you have areas of high occurrence of snow leopards and ungulates. You have areas of low occurrence of snow leopards and ungulates. And you have areas of medium occurrence. I mean, you can define what high, low, medium is. You know, occupancy is just basically sometimes a value between zero and one. Zero meaning there's nothing there. And one meaning like that area is covered with, you know, snow leopards or, uh, or ungulates. So let's say you can say any area between 0.7 occupancy to one is high. Let's say 0.4 to 0.7 is medium and anything be uh, below 0.4 is low. So to have that stratification is important. And what we did uh, uh, in India and lots of teams are doing it across snow leopard landscapes and then go to each of these strata and do, uh, for snow leopards, they end up doing camera trapping or scat sampling. Uh, there's something in the chat, I just see. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, yeah, they go to each of these um, uh, strata, high, medium, and low. Uh, and for, uh, for snow leopards, they do camera tra trapping or scat sampling. And for uh, ungulates, at least we did double observer surveys. And all in all, then you get a sense of ungulate densities, snow leopard densities, or even population genetics. And in this case, a holistic idea of snow leopard population ecology. But what I want to say is, basically this sort of study design is important because it allows you to stratify this large landscape and then study high, medium and low areas. Um, you know, for snow leopards, as I said, we did camera trapping side by side, we did double observer surveys. And if you remember the second slide, I showed you that graph of snow leopard population and um, prey population, that's how we got that. Uh, had we not done this study design, we would not be able to robustly see it because we would maybe only be studying in the high area or the medium area or the low area. So just to give you a sense of uh, how to shape potential study design. So one more quick activity. And then uh, after this, we'll jump into uh, some uh, breakout rooms, which I'll talk about in a second. We've spoken about, uh, you know, why mountain ungulates are important. We've spoken about why to monitor them uh, and how to monitor them and some challenges associated with that. But we've not so, spoken much about threats um, to mountain ungulates, particularly in these snow leopard areas or mountain areas in general. Um, can people list some threats uh, that are there uh, in to, uh, to ungulates in your area? Again, you can list it in the chat, or you can even just unmute and tell me, um, you know, what. Also, uh, do add, you know, what species you're talking about and what area and what the threat is. Uh, so, yeah. Resource collection. Uh, Sonam, what do you mean by that? Uh, thank you so much, uh, doctor. So resource collection, I mean, like uh, in Bhutan, we have a system of collecting cordyceps, uh, mm -hmm. of your cordyceps sinuses and the mountain areas. And uh, mm -hmm. so these are one threat that uh, people are encroaching in their habitat. So this okay. is what I feel like as a threat. And then, yeah. uh, and then we have uh, herders as well, so mm -hmm. domestic cattle. So it's actually uh, uh, it's a threat to the wild uh, ungulates and the mountain ungulates. I mean, yeah, yeah this yeah. is my uh, opinion. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Onam. Thank for sure. Yeah, resource collection and livestock grazing along alongside that is definitely a threat. Flavia says uh, poaching. Yeah, absolutely. Many areas, uh, 
mountain anglets are poached for their meat or for um, you know for their trophies and, and whatnot. So that's definitely a threat. Climate change, Justine, yes. Pasture degradation, uh, absolutely. Habitat fragmentation is definitely an issue. Climate change again. Water in the dry season. Interesting. Flavia, do you want to explain a little bit more? Uh, I mean, I get a sense of what you're saying, but why exactly and how is that a threat? Uh, hi, uh, I'm talking more specifically specifically about Brazil. <laughs> so sure. uh, in this case, yes, uh, in some areas here we have like um, a very, very dry season. And mm -hmm. in this case, like uh, the lagoons, they dry up and then it can be very difficult on animals, especially yeah. uh, animals yeah. with large, uh, that cover large areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing. I think, yeah, that's definitely also the case in many of the snow leopard landscapes. I know, for example, some areas in Mongolia where my colleagues work, Justine works, I think that's definitely a factor. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, competition for food with livestock, yes. Ecological and anthropogenic pressures. Uh, Rabina, do you want to uh, explain that a little bit more? Do you, are you speaking about something specifically or in general? from Nepal and especially and uh, talking about anthropogenic pressure uh, I like to focus on uh, human encroachment in forest area so mm -hmm. the habitat is integrated due to the human encroachment that's the major problem in our country and talking okay. about the ecological um, um, there is lots of invasive species is major threat that is degrading the habitat of the ungulates. Mm -hmm. So, of course, hunting and poaching because the because of the lack of uh, uh, strict rules, law against such activities. So mm -hmm. these are the major threats of ungulates in Nepal. Great. No, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, I agree. Yamna says deforestation, uh, Riaz says poaching, livestock grazing, accompanying herders, herding dogs. Yeah, dogs are a big problem. Uh, they can both kill wildlife and even make them sort of run away. Fuel wood and other uh, non-timber forest product collection. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Riaz. Land use change, uh, wildlife livestock conflict. Sorry, I'm just running through these. Climate change and land degradation, development activities. Absolutely invasive species uh in Afga oh sorry in afghanistan poaching of ungulates is the main threat followed by livestock encroachment yeah absolutely uh situation along the border armed conflict yeah riaz do you want to explain why that is a problem um maybe uh with an example to share and i think it's especially important because a lot of snow leopard landscapes is very transboundary uh, so yeah uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, due to the conflict or the worst situation along the borders, you will have shelling and all going on. You have already uh, fences, very destructive fences along the borders, which <clears throat> if, if any animal can, you know, uh, uh, get with it, it will be just killed. And then you have... Uh, when there is a uh, problem in the country or there is a conflict, this conservation and all it it takes a back seat. <laughs> it's not a priority mm -hmm. for for people and all, and you are not able to do the conservation work so effectively. And then uh, when you have armed conflict, you have armed people anyway in these areas. You have besides local people or besides uh, herders, you have all other people there and, and the field stuff is sometimes not that uh, easily, they can't easily go into these areas and, uh, you know, patrol those areas. So it's sort of out yeah. of control. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Riaz. And obviously you've worked a lot in these kind of areas, so it's really nice to hear from that. And yeah, it's, it's definitely an unfortunate uh, reality, but I think it's something that's so uh, prevalent in different areas across, particularly across on leopard landscapes. So I think it's important to acknowledge that um, 
So thanks. Uh, yeah, quickly running through the remaining feral dogs. Uh, Navid says in Pakistan, illegal hunting, human disturbance, habitat loss, absolutely. And Justine agrees that fences lead to fragmentation. Uh, that's definitely a huge concern. And fences around infrastructural development uh, are also something to think about. So yeah, absolutely. I think what's interesting is there's very similar threats in many ways, and then there's very diverse threats uh, when we're talking about mountain ungulates in general across the world, but also particularly in some leopard landscapes. So what I thought we could do uh, for the remaining, uh, we have about what we have about just over 30 minutes. So I'll just give you a quick summary of five different uh, case studies. And oh, is there something in the chat? Uh, Flavia says, in Brazil, the current politics is, is helping increase problems of guns and biodiversity. More guns are easily accessible, I guess. Yeah, that's frustrating, I'm sure. Uh, and yeah, it's interesting how politics plays with ecology. Uh, and I think uh, that's important to acknowledge, if not uh, deal with. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. So yeah, I'll quickly run through some case studies. So five very short case studies. Then we'll uh, disperse into maybe uh, five different um, uh, breakout rooms. Uh, and then we'll discuss what potential solutions for those threats, the specific threats might be there. Uh, you know, sort of conservation interventions. You have to wear your conservationist hat and think that, you know, you've been given that task to solve. Uh, what would you do? Uh, and how actually, both what and how, I think those are equally important uh, to discuss. So do um, sort of hear all five and then I'll uh, break, you, uh, break uh, you into breakout rooms and then uh, each breakout room number uh, would be that case study number. So for example, breakout room number one would tackle case study one and I'll go across breakout rooms. So quickly uh, speaking about case study one, it's the Ibex in the fields. Basically, Ibex are crop raiding, you know, it's summer season uh, and they're coming from the mountains into these uh, agricultural areas. Uh, they're predominantly peas and barley that are grown here. And that's the only thing that's grown in this village. It's somewhere in Spiti in India uh, because it's a very high area. And this is the sole uh, source of livelihood for the local people. There is no livestock. They only grow this cash crop. But the pea is the cash and the barley is the uh, sort of the... Uh, you know, just the food crop here. Yeah. And the Ibex are coming in and uh, eating all of this away. And this is a big problem. But what to keep uh, in mind is also these are locals uh, that are Buddhists, the, the locals that live here, and they don't tend to kill wildlife. So they don't, they try not to harm wildlife. But clearly this is a big problem uh, for the people. So what could potentially be the solution there? So this is case one, Ibex in the field. Uh, case study number two, is something that we hear quite a lot, livestock grazing in key barrel or blue sheep areas. So again, maybe we're up in somewhere in uh, the Tibetan Plateau or uh, Eastern Ladakh where I am. There's lots of livestock, they're overgrazing areas, particularly areas where barrel or blue sheep are giving birth, right? So females are giving birth to young. Uh, because of this, there's less food for the females and the blue sheep are giving less birth Oh, well, they're giving lesser kids or kids are dying. So this um, uh, sort of reality, what can be done uh, here? And the livestock grazing is sedentary grazing. So basically people are going every day to these areas, coming back to their village. Uh, so that's case study number two. Case study number three is that there is a disease outbreak in a barrel area, maybe where somewhere in Nepal. Uh, and, you know, there's a disease outbreak. We don't know exactly what disease it is but we know it's killing a lot of the adult blue sheep. Uh, and what we do know is that it's happening in both areas where there are livestock and there are no livestock as well. Uh, what I don't have here is we also know that there are some outbreaks happening in the livestock as well. Uh, so what can be done in case study number three? Case study four is musk deer being hunted. So, you know, there are uh, must deer uh, across. Um, oh, uh, there, uh, there's something in the chat. There's a serious case of sarcoptic sabies infection in ungulates. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And that's unfortunate. I'd love to know what's happening uh, to that. Do you want to explain uh, to us uh, now or maybe later what might 
be happening. Maybe we'll do it uh, later when we discuss, uh, if that's okay, because then I think that might be richer uh, to discuss. But thank you for pointing that out. Uh, and I'm sure I'll uh, look back to that, yeah. Uh, we had a outbreak of uh, sarcoptic scabies in Sirau, uh, I think in, a, in four or five years ago uh, in one of our field sites. So that was very sad. So yeah, case study four, musk deer being hunted, they're killed for their pods because they're, they have these musks, uh, the males uh, that are sold uh, in illegal markets. And this is happening uh, despite it being illegal. So what could be done there? And this is happening in huge numbers predominantly both by local communities and by some, you know, in uh, people that are coming into these uh, places. Last but not the least, uh, sort of illegal trophy hunting of Argali, wild trophy hunting uh, is very important. Um, you know, in some areas, uh, it's causing an issue. And what is that issue? It's basically leading to overexploitation and there's some corruption involved. And because of that corruption, people are killing more trophies and uh, then what's permitted uh, and, you know, that's over exploiting the population. So there are these five uh, case studies. I hope you, I'll stop sharing my screen quickly. I hope you remember them all. I'll go from one group to the other, uh, but I want you to go into your groups and basically discuss what potential solution, conservation solutions may, uh, might there be for these, um, for these issues. But also I want you to, as I said, think about the solution, but also what would your, what your approach be? So we'll give you 10 minutes and at the end of 10 minutes, uh, maybe we'll come back and we'll discuss maybe one person from each group uh, can give us a bit of uh, understanding of what you guys discuss. So great. Let me make breakout rooms. Great. Nice to see everyone pouring back in. I'm so sorry, guys. I wanted to give more time. I feel like the breakout rooms are the fun bit all the time, but they always end up... <laughs> <laughs> Shorter, shorter, so I apologize. But I hope you had a um, yes. discussion. You can just dump your thoughts on us. I mean, no, okay. never enough to solve any cause. Sometimes 10 years are not enough to solve conservation issues. So 10 minutes are very okay. But yeah, feel free to just dump your thoughts because I think this is more a sharing experience. So we can just think about uh, some... Well, right. in the initial thing, I just only came up with one idea. No matter what case study I'm going to pick up, it is going to lead to human ungulates conflict. Exactly. No what I do, it is going to involve the humans, the yeah. um, accessing population, and their invasion in the areas. So, okay, let's just... Great. No, that's, that's true. Okay. So, yeah, we, with that, we'll start with case study one. So, what I'll request is I'll uh, call upon each of the case studies. So whoever's presenting, feel free for, uh, you know, the entire group person, but just give a very brief uh, introduction of what your case study was just to refresh everyone's memory. And then, yeah, what your solutions were. So case study, which was the Ibex in the field. Yeah. Okay, the case was, I think, uh, the Ibex in the cropping area uh, within the Bhutan population where they do not retaliate or kill the wild animals. Um, this is the case study. And the problem is if they're not retaliating, then, then again, it is more like uh, the livestock is increasing in the same way as Dori or Ibex species. Okay, they both are in a positively increasing population. But the problem is not between the human and ungulates conflict. The conflict is going to arise between the livestock the crops and the ibex. So the humans, I'm just going to minus the humans from the equation at this very moment. I am just arranging my thoughts while speaking, okay? So what we came up with was the compensation, the endowment funds that we really use in Pakistan and I don't know the country of Sonam. I just forgot it, I'm sorry. Uh, these are the compensation programs. We do have policy in Pakistan, in every province, and in every territory. Plus, uh, we go for community engagement and awareness. Uh, the more like the more the humans or the Bhutan population is aware of the needs of Oriyal and how they are interacting with the crops, they can use the alternate crops or the alternate areas for growing the crops, which will reduce the conflict 
that odial might not damage their crops where they are more active we are going to avoid the active areas of uh, ibex and use those areas for the crop growing which are less used by the population and flavia if you can just throw light on the alternate crops concept i was it was difficult for me to grasp it Us. Uh, we also discussed, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned uh, the fencing areas and we, we will oh, dis discuss yes. that. If it, it, it's, it, we don't know the area, so it's difficult to discuss, but <laughs> if possible to fence, uh, we would have to uh, evaluate if uh, animals can pass the wild animals, so it's not blocking the wild animals and also we discussed um, community engagement and possible alternative crops mm -hmm. so to study if uh, the uh, if alternative seeds for them to plant that are less attractable to the wild animals uh, would be a solution as well but, and people could be either a selling crop or a feeding eating crops so uh, we don't know the area so it's we just thought about it as well i think that's that's it and the management of plants and sonam please elaborate your fencing that you use in your areas i think you it will be good if you share uh, it think, um, you mean you mean the electric fencing and all this thing yes 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 yes, yes. Uh, okay, I was just suggesting like uh, electric fencing is one uh, measure that we are adopting in Bhutan uh, to just uh, temporarily guard the crops, not for the permanent, but uh, as I mentioned, like it has got advantage as well as disadvantage point. So advantage, we can uh, guard the crop for a temporal uh, time, tem temporary uh, portion of uh, duration. And then the disadvantage part is like, uh, it will just displease the wildlife, I think, uh, from one, one place to another place where there is no uh, electric fencing. So this is what I thought. And then another thing is like, uh, so, uh, in case one, I think uh, locals, uh, locals are Buddhists and so they don't kill wildlife. So in this case, I think we do not have any suggestion because we cannot, uh, uh, I think, force to, uh, you know, what to say now, to change change their, what to say, religion or anything, anything, and then go for hunting or killing these animals. But the thing is that we have, as as Shizan, Shizan I mentioned, like we have, uh, we it would be better to uh, initiate uh, the uh, insurance scheme, endowment fund for livestock and uh, livestock, I mean like crop insurance scheme. And then community engagement is another very important part of uh, conservation. So I think uh, in short, uh, these are the points that we have discussed. And then if there's anything that we have left out, so I think other group may uh, add on it. And then uh, another thing is that uh, the potential uh, to to get the potential solution to find a potential solution, we need assessment to to carry do uh, conduct research and then uh, uh, carry out uh, assessment. For instance, like uh, Flavia mentioned, like alternative crops. So, which uh, crops is uh, feasible? Uh, for instance, like Bhutan, in case of Bhutan. So, if I cite one example, so uh, for instance, like rice and maize are being cultivated out here for uh, as, a, as a cereal crops, and these are the main crops that are being cult cultivated. But then, um, if life, uh, if uh, wildlife are uh, creating a mess in these uh, fields of crops, then uh, uh, we are shifting to tea, uh, green tea. You know, green tea, the uh, which we we usually uh, find uh, see in the Assam area, the tea tea garden. So most of the people are also encouraged in these areas. So we are uh, we also encourage to um, uh, what to say now uh, revive the fellow lands lands, and then to uh, narrow down. The, I mean, like uh, uh, what to say now to. Um, uh, reduce the, uh, minimize the uh, human wildlife, uh, human uh, crop, uh, I mean, well, crop, human, uh, crop, wildlife conflict, I mean. Okay. Yeah. I think this, 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 
this much I can say that. So most of the things are uh, covered by Shenza, Shezana and then Flavia. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. That was really interesting. And it's so interesting for me to hear as well, because, I mean, this is a case study from uh, one of my field sites as well. And uh, we've struggled and I'll share a little bit as to what we've done. But it's really nice to hear these different perspectives. And I think what's important for me uh, to hear from you guys is multi-pronged, uh, you know, sort of uh, interventions are important and also to test them uh, is, is important. So thank you for sharing. Uh, with that, group two, which was, I think, the livestock overgrazing in blue sheep uh, areas, particularly where they birth. Um, any volunteers from group two to discuss what you guys thought? Um, I can share some of the things that were discussed in our, uh, in our group. So, um, Naveed, I guess, uh, had the experience in Pakistan where um, he was talking about making sure that uh, the local people um, basically conduct uh, community conservation programs and uh, awareness of the locals uh, to ensure that they understand the issue. That's the first of, I mean, first of all, that's like a, uh, one of the key uh, uh, and important points to make sure that the locals understand the perspective because as a conservationist, we know the issue, but it's very important to make sure that the locals also understand it. And then there were, um, there were also other thoughts regarding rotational grazing in, in, in areas that is not sensitive to wildlife. Um, and then also uh, law enforcement, I'm sure. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, okay, go on. I think there was a disturbance, but please go on. Okay, so rotational grazing uh, would be important in areas wh which is not sensitive to uh, to uh, the blue sheep. I thought uh, it was boral, so I was we were talking about boral, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, to the to the to the wild angulate, and then law enforcement was also very important to make sure that the grazing practices are. Um, in areas that are not sensitive to, uh, to, to wildlife, which would obviously um, uh, trigger human wildlife conflict uh, if there are like a lot of uh, encounters with the wildlife. Um, there was also a uh, discussion regarding possible alternative income source for the community. So uh, the locals do not focus on grazing, uh, uh, on, on increasing their, their livestock numbers. Um, and then there was also, um, um, we were also thinking that there should be sort of like a, a zoning program where grazing areas are identified and then seasonally restrict grazing to make sure uh, it's avoided from the breeding sites uh, to make sure that in the seasons of the, the breeding, those areas are avoided and only grazing is um, uh, than in other areas. I would also like other uh, group members if they wanted to share if I missed things. Thanks. Thanks, Hakikia. Yeah, anybody else uh, from group two? Hi, I'm Rosa, and I would like to add that giving additional supplements to the livestock can also reduce the grazing intensity like uh, there there are wheat and barley straws that are grown in higher mountain that can be fed to the cattle as well thank you great no thanks thanks group two uh, i mean i I always love these kind of discussions because they fill me up with so much optimism. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's so important uh, uh, that you guys also thought about uh, the fact that before doing something, it's important to share that perspective of why an issue might be there, you know, with the local stakeholders rather than just doing something. So I think, yeah, that is important in terms of the approach in addition to uh, just the intervention. So thanks. Thanks for that. I'm conscious of time. So we might run over a little bit, but I'll try to not uh, run over too much because we have three more groups very quickly. Uh, so with, uh, without further ado, uh, group number three, please, which I think was the disease outbreak again in Blue Sheep, uh, both in areas with livestock and without livestock. 
uh, what could be done there. So anyone from group three to volunteer? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Nasratullah Jahid. I want to talk on behalf of the group three. Uh, yes, we just uh, had a very short discussion about uh, the disease transmission in general. Uh, uh, we talked uh, as, as, as some experience we had from our work area, uh, like me from Afghanistan, from the Wakhan National Park, uh, we had a vaccination campaign uh, throughout the landscape to avoid the disease transmission, especially the zoonotic disease uh, throughout, uh, from, from the livestock to uh, the wildlife, uh, especially in those areas, because we were focused on, on areas that uh, wildlife and livestock share their habitat or their grazing from the same landscape. So those are the main hotspot areas to uh, 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 launch uh, uh, vaccination program. Uh, on that, uh, another subject that we also talked uh, uh, about how to mitigate some poaching or some other threats to the wildlife in general, uh, again, uh, we shared our experience on, on some activities we had in, in some national parks, like in Afghanistan, again in Wahan National Park and in Bandi Amir National Park of Afghanistan. Uh, we applied the smart system uh, in the area. Uh, so during five or six years of applying that system, uh, we had some good achievement uh, in wildlife population. And we actually, we had a, a dramatic uh, mitigation of uh, poaching in the area. And we found it so useful. Uh, but unfortunately, after the collapse of the previous government, uh, uh, all the achievement has gone and it's almost gone, but uh, the, and the, the conservation activities are uh, getting so low in that two national parks. And we are afraid that if mm, something immediate not happening uh, on those areas, uh, we will face uh, a disaster in, in our wildlife. Uh, so that's all my thoughts, and uh, so my friends can add uh, if I have missed anything. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michaela from Group 3. Um, we also talked a bit about um, figuring out what kind of disease would be affecting the population. So if it's a more well-known disease and you kind of have a list of diseases that are naturally occurring in the population, then you could determine whether it's that and whether that's something that the population is used to dealing with or if it's a novel disease. Um, the fact that it's present with and without livestock, we kind of came up with two scenarios that either it's a naturally occurring disease just affecting the wildlife populations or it could possibly be a domestic disease that fully um, kind of hopped the barrier into the wildlife populations. And then the population closest to the domestic livestock then managed to spread that through the environment or through contact or whichever to uh, popu other sectors of the population that don't directly go face to face with the livestock. So there's definitely a lot of different factors that I think you would kind of have to consider, but I I wasn't quite sure how you would, how or if you would help the population with the disease, like if that's ethically, like you're supposed to just leave the population to try to sort itself out and hopefully they'll recover and then become stronger from it or, um, you know, like you can give vaccines to, to domestic species, but I, I don't know, you know, if you're supposed to just sit and, and let nature handle itself is, I guess, what, what would be it, but I don't know, that's kind of where I dropped off, like you can figure out what kind of diseases 
is happening in the population, but then I wasn't sure like what that next step would be or if there is any. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Kupri, for sharing that. And yes, I want to echo uh, what's been said in the chat. Uh, the work in Makan uh, by Nasrullah and your team has been very inspirational. I think everybody should know more about it. I think there's a few really nice reports <clears throat> around it. So please do share uh, with us on the Google group. Uh, I think that's <clears throat> absolutely inspirational. Uh, and we hope um, that, you know, uh, that can be kept up into the future with all the difficulties. And <clears throat> thanks, Michaela, also for talking about the ethical conundrum that pops up. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to, uh, for us to focus both on what can be done, but how it can be done as well. Because I think that's something that needs to be considered. And I think that becomes even more problem, not problematic, but like something to factor in when uh, things are happening naturally to populations, perhaps. Uh, so yeah, great points. Uh, again, keeping in mind time, I'm sorry, this discussion can go on, but quickly to group four, which was the case study on musk deer being hunted for pods uh, illegally. Uh, somebody from group four? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, sir, it was the musk deer being killed for their pods and uh, that was happening despite being illegal by both locals and other parties coming in. And there were policies regarding it. Uh, in some countries, it is five to 15 years imprisonment and 1 million fine, uh, like in Nepal, uh, one of my teammates shared. And there are then countries like Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Pakistan, which do not have any policies regarding it. No legal actions have been taken uh, against anybody who is killing musk deers. So what we came up to was the countries need to collaborate. Everybody should come on one international platform for the protection of this species because it's greatly endangered. And not only on the enforcement issues, but also to establish a system of information so that they can share how many families of musk deers are there and population and everything. Secondly, there should be a policy of implementation, either the musk for medicinal purposes and for perfumes, et cetera, should be uh, banned at all. Or maybe there should be some uh, marking system for raw musk and the labeling of musk products to allow legal musk products to be easily identifiable. And not that any uh, mask uh, coming illegally also can infiltrate in the market. So that was all we could come up with. Great. I mean, that's, yeah, sorry, there's one more. Uh, begin to, yeah, go on. Yeah, hello, everyone. I want to add that uh, we could also use some innovations. Lately, we could use unmanned vehicles to monitor uh, the poachers or something like that. And we could. Uh, we could also use transboundary cooperations uh, to stop the poachings and uh, uh, intervene in their trade routes. And I also want to add that we could also use communities because in Nepal, community-based anti-poaching units have been really effective uh, in stopping poachings of uh, one and rhinoceros in the plains. So we could use that also, I think. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I find it very interesting that you guys brought up the more international aspect of this work and collaboration and sort of, yeah, transboundary uh, policies and, and things like that. So that's very, very important. Thank you for bringing that up because, yeah, I think issues can be very local and global at the same time. So I think it's important to reconcile that scale. Awesome. So last but not least, group five, which was around trophy hunting of Argali, which was illegal. Uh, both for trophy and for meat. Uh, so what can be done there? Group five, anyone? Kenji? Yes. Kenji, maybe. Kenji, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. Justin, because I missed some parts, this is why maybe someone from our group can present and if something is missing, I can add. Anyone else then? Apart from Justine, she can always add in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can add. Kenji, you, yeah. you were in most of it. Go ahead. Don't worry. Yeah, maybe you say whatever you remember, and then, yeah, Justine can add. Can say, yeah. um, okay, so we um, discussed about uh, illegal poaching, Argalis, um, and then we also think of uh, if it is happening uh, locally or internationally, depending on that, um, we discussed. Uh, what can we do to solve those issues in the area? 
so also it is uh, uh, it is always uh, nice to know uh, helpful to know about um, what they are poaching for yes what trophy i mean what they are looking for and what uh, markers they are using and depending on that then the solution comes up but um, i just uh, personally uh, suggested the idea to and patrol uh, with the help of conservation dogs, uh, because uh, you know that if the conservation dogs are trained on the certain derivatives, for example, on Argalis, yeah, so it can be very helpful to detecting the uh, trophies. Uh, so that can be one of the issues to solve. Um, and also, uh, I mean, um, so usually in Kyrgyzstan, we are practicing that. Uh, at the eco process, and then when the people are going through the eco process, um, I mean, poachers can be checked, and then the conservation dogs are being very helpful. Um, but uh, if we talk about the area, community can be disturbed also by the dogs if they patrol all the time, and it can be also disturbing. We discuss all these issues, and uh, um, I mean, in the eco process, it can be helpful, but also. Um, I mean, if we are talking about the national parks areas, yeah, their areas, it can be useful uh, there at the eco posts. But if it is happening in the uh, just ordinary areas like mountains, yes, and then it can be difficult also to detect them. Uh, so maybe some other other group members can add. I would like to add something uh, on trophy hunting of Argyle. If the population density of a place, uh, if the population density of Argyle is better in one place, we could uh, use legal hunting, legal trophy hunting cases. For example, we have Dwarpatran hunting reserve here in Nepal that helps uh, in uh, blue sheep, uh, that is legalized in blue sheep hunting. So we could improve the trophy hunting by legalizing it in some place and bringing in international hunters, ethical hunters to hunt for the trophy and the other point that was suggested uh, was alternative job opportunities for the local individuals who are involved in trophy hunting for example we could develop ecotourism base in the area and it could help in controlling the uh, trophy hunting so uh, such as uh, and the other point i would like to add on uh, law enforcement or dog use of dog it can be here in Nepal, we have armies that patrol the Thorai Arc landscape. The Thorai Arc landscape so it helps in conservation. So, for example, if uh, Argali, they are highland uh, island creatures. So, in those areas, if the uh, police or army or law enforcement can increase their patrolling or community uh, community enforcement, it could be a useful way to decrease trophy hunting of Argali. So, that would all I'd like to add. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I mean, these are lovely points, uh, both from the perspective of on-ground work and at also sort of like policy level, as you guys were saying. Uh, great. I think uh, that's... Oh, Kenzie, do you want to say something? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, also, some someone also wrote here about smart system, yeah? Smart patrolling is also is uh, widely used here. It can be also helpful uh, with um, fighting... Uh, poachers, yeah, and also I think well, that um, traditional stories about uh, the species can be also helpful to stop the poaching. And for example, during the um, uh, snow leopard uh, uh, surveys, we found out that locals considered the snow leopard as a predator, like hunter, hunting species, and this is why like hunters uh, didn't hunt hunters you know in that principle they didn't usually kill snow leopards if we also spread among the community about such kind of traditional uh, stories uh, make like brochures or the on the internet maybe some videos to to spread the information so it can be also helpful to stop poaching yeah that's super interesting yeah getting them the, uh, to connect with the species uh, on a cultural and a more traditional basis. Great. Uh, that was really, really fun uh, for me. At least I'm sure hopefully it was uh, fun for everyone else as well. Um, 
I think with that, I see we're six minutes over time. So I'll just very quickly share some of my thoughts and then we'll wrap up the session. So as we can see, you know, ungulates face lots of different disease uh, threats, not disease being one, <laughs> threats across the, the landscape, particularly in snow leopard landscapes. And as we've discussed, you know, there's many, many different things that can be done. So it's important to think about what to be uh, done while ensuring we do it in a as much as, as an ethical and sort of a, you know, sensitive manner as possible, because often these are uh, issues linked to places where people and their sort of livelihoods take place as well. So thank you for sharing all these things. Just a few uh, quick thoughts from my end. Uh, what we do here in India for things around uh, hunting of musk deer and uh, potentially something that can be used uh, if you know there's illegal trophy hunting happening as well. Uh, we have something called uh, a system of local champions. What we do basically there is try to empower local people, be it forest uh, office officials or wildlife officials or just local, you know, herders or, or villagers who are interested in wildlife to sort of empower them to be uh, the voice for the local wildlife and maybe, you know, uh, work with people who are poaching uh, to sort of reduce poaching. So rather than us sort of telling them all the time, it's these local custodians and local ambassadors for wildlife that we maybe train in different uh, things or, you know, back them with uh, sort of support uh, to deal with these situations. So that's something that we've been trying and it's been working well and not so well in some areas with the grazing bit and even the disease bit, which sometimes gets transmitted. We uh, try to do, uh, try to set up these community-based livestock grazing free reserves. Essentially what we do there is we work with the community to say, okay, you know, at this time of the year, Barala birthing. So rather than going there, you know, where they birth, because we know some information from before, maybe through surveys, can you not graze there for, let's say, one month and can you graze somewhere else? And in return, maybe we incentivize that by giving something to the community, which they you know some service to the community. So that's something that's been happening as well. Um, yeah, so just uh, things like that for the crop issue, uh, particularly in Spiti, which is in uh, northern India, we uh, try to train crop guards who sort of, you know, uh, uh, wake up early in the morning and sort of, you know, push Ibex away uh, before they come into the fields. Because generally during the day, people are there, so Ibex go away. But it's in the mornings when they come. So these crop guards sort of, you know, keep them away. So, yeah, these kind of things. Similar to uh, what the guys did in Afghanistan, uh, we try to vaccinate livestock against diseases that are, uh, you know, in, both in wildlife, particularly in wild ungulates and livestock, so that can reduce transmission. But I think as Michaela said, we're also trying to build just a repository of what kind of diseases are there in wild ungulates in general to see if something can be done at all or, or, or not. So just to give you a sense of uh, different sort of uh, conservation interventions that we're doing, but the range of things that you guys spoke about, I think, uh, is something that needs to be cherished and yeah, hopefully implemented in the right spirit across uh, areas where there are threats. I think with this uh, and being 10 minutes over time, which I apologize for, <laughs> uh, thank, thanks, Sugi. I think we'll close this session. All I want to leave you guys with is uh, hopefully the session made us think a little bit about, you know, why these mountain ungulates are important, uh, how to study them a little bit and what challenges are there and, you know, uh, what sort of innovative conservation solutions there might be to think about ungulates, not just as prey for uh, snow leopards, but as important elements of these mountain ecosystems because they truly are that alongside being important prey to things like snow leopards. Um, and, you know, I'm available for discussions. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in any of this. You know, it's something that we'll learn together and I've learned a lot from all of you guys today. But, you know, happy to discuss things over the Google group. Uh, and I think my email is as well there in the Google group. But if anybody needs it, I'm happy to share that as well. And yeah, I think with that, we can uh, sort of get this to be a close. Thanks. Thanks for all the wonderful messages.